All right, lead heads, we are back. This is episode 206, and this is the week of July 4th, celebrating our independence for, what is it, 200 and, is it 241 years? Gosh, I don't even know how long it is. How long is it, Jansen? <laughs> Do you know? Uh- I'm going to say 250. It's a good, good round number. 250? Yeah, I don't know that we hit 250 yet. I think it's like 241 or 231. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's what Google's for, right? <laughs> right. So, uh, so our guest this week is Jansen Jones with Freedom Munitions and also with Nerds. You guys heard Jansen on our NRA special edition. Welcome in, Jansen. Hey, thanks for having me. And we're kind of stalling and waiting on Chad, Chad Enos, to join us. Um, as you guys may or may not remember from that show, these guys were going on a bear hunt using that new uh, big grains round from Freedom Munitions, and that's what we're going to be talking about today on that hunt. And then Jansen also had uh, another one too, right? Yeah, I, I left NRA show on Sunday and flew to Alberta, Canada to hunt spring bear uh, up there, and then came back to Idaho and hunted with Chad the uh, following week. Cool. So you're going to have some great stories for us. I'm looking forward to to talking to you about that. And then maybe that'll give us some time to uh, to get Chad on here. You hear my phone blowing up there. That's... He, he's trying to be fashionably late. That's what I think's going on. Is that what it is? Yeah. That's yeah. probably what it is. He's, he's just saving, saving his time for the good stuff. But uh, while we're waiting on Chad, I want to go ahead and announce to you Leadheads, the three finalists for the Talking Lead Leadhead Logo Design Contest with 1776 United. And uh, we had some great submissions on that. Appreciate you guys taking part. And there were some there were some great submissions on that, but we had to narrow it down to three. So we went with the three that we thought best would represent you guys as the Leadhead. Some of you guys kind of missed the boat and you were doing some jack wagon. Uh, logos and doing some logos with me, but I wanted something that represented you guys, uh, the Leadhead Nation out there, and uh, I feel that we'll be able to make something work with these three. So Brad Scouton submitted, I would like to see a design with crossed rifles or flintlocks and the word infantry on it. Uh, So I kind of like that idea, maybe like Leadhead Infantry, you know, something like that. So he, he did a verbal design. So what we're doing is we're having these drawn up, and we're going to post these on social media so you guys can vote on them. So James at 1776 is in the process of designing these, getting the concepts worked out, uh, and then we're going to post those. So that's one from Brad. Second one is from Travis Chapman, and Travis submitted. He actually uh, a little artistic. He had, he had some abilities. Boy's got some skills. He drew... Uh, an actual bullet uh, being fired, and it's kind of comical looking. In, on the uh, casing, it's got you know kind of a face, some eyeballs, and a mouth, and he's kind of grunting, showing his teeth, aggressive look. And then the bullet is coming out with smoke coming out of the top of it, and then it says "Leadhead" over the top of it. So that's kind of cool. That would make a really good patch, I think, too. Uh, that design. Uh, but that was another thing too. These have to look good on a patch too, and they got to be able to fit on a patch. So we're doing patches and t-shirts with these. And then the third one is from none other than Leadhead number one, Chuck Sanford. Chuck submitted, and this is his idea: says certified in quotes in the same text and position as the Liberty in the 1776 United Liberty or Death T. Then Leadhead in the same text as the Lead in Talking Lead on the classic uh, t-shirt there. Outline the lettering of Leadhead with the shot up target filling the letters. And in the middle, a picture of a flowering hollow point. Kind of cool. I like that idea. We've got a little twist that we're probably going to do with that one. But um, you're going in the right direction with that. I like that. And then he says on the upper back of the T, put hashtag badasseriness which is, as you guys know, if you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, kind of one of our main hashtags that we put in there. So uh, those are our three finalists. Like I said, we're in the process of getting those designed, and uh, we're going to get them posted. And as soon as we do that, then you guys can start voting. And then the winner is going to get a patch, a T-shirt with that logo design on it, a classic Talking Lead T-shirt, and a $100 gift card to 1776 United's website to use however the hell you want to. So, pretty cool. 
So what do you think about all that? Which one do you think would look best, Jansen? I like the one that's got badassery-ness on it. Yeah, I'm kind of like the certified. I'm, I'm anxious to see how that's going to look. Uh, I really like that bullet head design that uh, Travis came up with. And then um, I think the one that Brad came up, out with was going to look good, too. Kind of looked crossed. He like he was going old style. He, he said flintlock. So I kind of like that, putting a little uh, little old style to it and calling it the infantry, talking lead infantry, lead head infantry. I like that. So it's good. I it's, dig it. They're going to look good. So once we get that, like I said, we'll make a make a post, let you guys know, and you can start the voting. And uh, the one who gets the most votes is the winner. So we just leave it up to you guys. And speaking of winners, and this being the holiday weekend, 4th of July, a lot of people have specials and sales. And Jansen Freedom Munitions is having a pretty big sale. Is that right? Going on this week. We are. We are. We're running our free shipping and 5% off, $99 or more on our website. Nice. And there's a little something else going on with that, right? Right. Every order, there's actually no purchase necessary. Um, you can mail in an entry form to be entered, but we are giving away five Bushmaster AR-15 rifles, basically the optics ready carbine style. Um, to anybody that places an order from July 1 to July 5th, or you can go to the website and click on the, the more information tab and print out the entry form and mail it in. So there's no technical purchase necessary to nice. enter to win this rifle package. Now, how long is this going to run? How long do they have to enter it, this? It runs through the end of July 4th. So up until 11.59 Pacific Standard Time on July 4th. Okay, and you're going to be giving away five Correct. So you guys listening to this show on Wednesday, you missed out. Sorry. Eh. <laughs> Should have downloaded the show sooner. Uh, what about your, your free shipping? How long is that going to run? That's going to run through the end of the week. Okay. So they got a little more time on that one. That's good. And are you running uh, any ammo specials right now? We do have a whole plethora of different deals. Um, if you go to the weekly deals page, you'll be able to see all the stuff that's eligible. But we have a sale on some Vortex Optics. Uh, one of the big grains, 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum loads is on sale. we got some ETS magazines, some 9mm ammo, uh, CRKT knives. All of that is discounted plus, again, $99 or more. Free shipping right to your door. Free shipping, $99 or more. Awesome. And uh, with the prices on that ammo that you guys have, uh, $99 gets you a shit ton. So load up, leadheads. So other people that are having some awesome deals this week, sponsors of the show, X-Steel Targets. They're having 25% off and a free T-shirt to the first 100 uh, people who place their orders. And this is going to go, I believe, until the end of the week as well. Use the code FIREWORKS17. Fireworks 17, and you get 25% off. That's anything on their website. Any of those AR500 steel targets that they have, you get 25% off. And the first 100 orders is going to get a free T-shirt as well. Nordic Components, they are having a pretty big sale as well. They're going to be offering 20% off any Nordic Component brand parts and rifles. So... Speaking of their rifles, I just got a shipment in of about six of them. They're 308s, the um, 300 Blackout, and finally got in the PCC, their 9mm carbine, and they are beautiful, guys. I'm telling you, um, if you've not bought a Nordic Components rifle yet, you got to check them out. They, they're beautiful rifles. They're exceptionally well made. The tolerances on these things are tight, uh, and the parts that they're using on these, uh, obviously, they're you know the components manufacturers uh, are very precise. The 300, the 308s that I got, uh, I got a 20 inch, uh, one of their long distance precision rifles. I got to get some glass for that, so maybe I'll go to Freedom since you guys are having a sale on the uh, the Vortex and uh, pick up some of those. But uh, you get 20% off any NC brand parts and rifles, plus there's a $300 instant rebate on select rifles. So go check out Nordic Components and take advantage of those awesome deals that they're having right there. Um, and then there's several other sites, uh, Friends of the Show, 
Primary Arms, I noticed, is having just a, a huge sale on all kinds of different things from um, stocks to handguards to barrels to uh, actual full rifles. I can't remember what brand that they sell there, but uh, there's some pretty good deals on some ARs there as well. Uh, and, of course, uh, Joe Bob Outfitters has always got some good prices. And who was the other one that I saw was having a pretty good deal? Devore. You ever go to Devore? You heard of Devore, Jansen? Oh, yeah. Those guys have one deal a day. Well, they have multiple items right. that are on sale for that day. It's awesome. Right. I get their emails. Yeah, yeah, I do too. So I, I noticed that they were having a pretty good uh, deal on some things as well. And I think they were having free shipping uh, also. So uh, go check all those sites out. And there's plenty of other, other ones that are doing it as well. Um, Frontier Tactical uh, has decided to kind of break from the norm and they're not having a holiday sale right now. But what you do with Frontier Tactical is uh, typically when everybody else is having sales, they're not having sales and the people aren't having sales, that's when they're having their sales. So we'll keep you posted on Frontier Tactical. Uh, but as always, any, any of the sponsors of the show, friends of the show, affiliates of the show, Use the code LEADHEAD when you go shopping there, and they've all got some sort of a discount set up for you LEADHEADS. So just remember that. Anytime you go shopping, LEADHEAD is the discount code that you use. And if it doesn't work, make sure you shoot me an email. Let me know so I can get in touch with them and have it reactivated if sometimes it expires. Um, Modern Spartan Systems, I know it's good there. Uh, right on USA Optics, it's good there several other places so what i'm going to do on my website is i need to do this i need to set up a page and it'll, it'll tell you guys everybody that uh, gives you discounts so we'll get that set up here in the next month all right so jansen we are still waiting on chad <laughs> so that gives us time for the talking lead jack wagon train are you familiar with that I've been listening to the podcast since uh, the NRA show, so I've gotten gotten familiar with it. I can't say I'm a veteran, but I'm, I'm aware. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna do the jack wagon train. We're gonna let Gunny bring that jack wagon train in. So Gunny, bring that train in. Hey, Ralph, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at eighth and nine. It is time for the talking lead jack wagon of the week. So brace yourself, baby. All right, the train has stationed. And I've got a couple of people I'm going to be throwing on the jack wagon train this week. What about you, Jansen? You got anybody you want to you want to toss on the train? Have you heard about the guy that was uh, shooting himself with the Desert Eagle, trying to stop it with a phone book? Oh yeah, I did. I, I didn't get the details on that, but I did see that. What happened with that? Well, in essence. This guy is sort of an internet stuntman, if you will, and he and his girlfriend, or maybe it's just his wife, I'm not sure, a significant other, film him doing some ridiculous, borderline dangerous behavior. And one of the things that he did, which ultimately took his life, was he was going to have a uh, phone book to his chest or some really dense book to see if it would stop a uh, 50 A and E. It didn't, and he subsequently book. died as a result of this. And it was all captured, apparently live or real time, on his YouTube channel. Really? Mm hmm Holy crap. So who shot him? Did he shoot himself? Did he like hold it up to him, to himself and shoot it? or uh, He had someone else pull the trigger, I believe. I got the report from my sales and marketing staff on Friday. They were the ones that were all over it and jumping in saying, hey, we need to make sure this guy didn't buy our ammo. So, of course, we were <laughs> going on, going in the customer database, looking it up, and luckily it wasn't ours. But, uh, you know, we just released that 50 A&E big grains load, and it's been popular enough where it wouldn't have surprised me if this guy was using it. So Let's see. I just did a quick search on it. Is, did this happen in Minnesota? This looks like this might be the one. I don't know where it took place. I just know it did take place. So a Minnesota teenager has been charged with manslaughter after firing a gun at her boyfriend in a stunt they hoped would make them famous on YouTube. That's him. Uh, it says, with two cameras positioned to catch their antics and with their three-year-old son in the room. Oh, my gosh. Mona Lisa Perez, 19, shot 22-year-old Pedro Ruiz in the chest from a foot away with a 50 a and &E, oh my gosh, while he held an encyclopedia as a shield. An encyclopedia. 
Uh, yeah, it it didn't work. <laughs> which, I wonder which encyclopedia, because encyclopedias aren't that thick. So, you know, if you got the A through Z edition, do you know what I mean? Did you have those growing up? Oh, yeah, Encyclopedia Britannica. That's right. Let's see. The sheriff's office received an emergency call, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we're making a YouTube video, and she accidentally shot him in the chest, according to court documents. I really have no idea what they were thinking. Well, they wanted to be famous. <laughs> That's what they were thinking. Everybody on YouTube's famous. I just don't understand the younger generation uh, and trying to get their 15. Exactly. That's just pure stupidity right there. And how does well, he we're, how does he get a 50 A and E anyway? I, I don't know. What we're seeing at this Eagle? point is almost, you know, the level of sensationalism continues to get ratcheted up and people are going for the next most daring or outrageous stunt. But what we're seeing is it's ultimately costing them their life when they make a mistake or they go just beyond the, the line. And obviously this guy didn't have a good grasp of ballistics or, you know, do a whole lot of due diligence because anybody in their right mind wouldn't have taken that, that challenge on, you know, in our community, right? none of us would have taken that. No, well, that's sheer stupidity right there. Um, I saw, and I, and I blame this on, I blame it on MTV. I'm going to blame MTV for this. And, uh, was his name Johnny Knoxville and those guys? Oh yeah. What Bam Margera, Steve-O, those guys. Yeah. What is that? It's jackass. Jackass. Yeah. Those yep. idiots. I was watching a documentary the other day. Um, and it was what these guys did prior to basically how they came into doing the jackass stuff. They were writing for some skater magazine or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but Johnny Knoxville, um, again, you know, trying to do stuff to get noticed, to get people to, to, you know, look, I guess buy the magazine that, or that they were, it wasn't a video at the time, but they were video in it. He put on a bulletproof vest and shot himself. Um, I can't remember what, what gun he was using, but it was some sort of revolver. And uh, he shot himself with that revolver. And uh, I guarantee that's, a, that's where they got this idea. I guarantee it. So you'd think they'd do like a practice shot or something beforehand to see if oh, it would actually stop you'd think it. You'd think they'd warm up. You know, they'd yeah. actually make sure that <laughs> this was going to work before they turn the cameras on and do a do live. Do a couple Apparently of practice not. pitches, you know, something like that, right? Amateur hour. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, welcome to the jack wagon train. That's stupid. Nineteen and twenty-two years old. Mm. Well, the the worst the worst result of that is the child. You know that that daughter, that young. Uh, I think they said he had a two or three year old daughter was there during that incident, and the yeah, in the, the same room, girl's right mom was the trigger trigger man, trigger woman. Right. So it's unfortunate all around. Yeah, nothing good came from that, obviously. No. All right, so welcome to the Jack Wagon Train um, YouTube fame wannabes. I don't know <laughs> what you're going to call them. Just idiots. So, and she's ruined her life, the the lady. I'm sure she's going to go to jail for that. She'll probably get, like, manslaughter or something like that. And then she... Oh, uh, her, she'll, she'll, she'll be charged with some sort of manslaughter if she's lucky it'll get pled down to a reckless conduct and i mean if she's really lucky she'll be put on some kind of probation you know that that girl that was there that the daughter she may be taken away by whatever child protective services are in minnesota just because of the sheer recklessness of it their whole lives are changed as a result of this everybody that was involved it's unfortunate right and i think she was pregnant too uh, where do we go from here? Well, we go to the next jack wagon, which <laughs> mine this week is going to be Keith Oberman. He was uh, his big claim to fame is he came from ESPN. I used to enjoy him on ESPN, actually, um, but he's since gotten way political, and obviously he's on the left side of the political spectrum. I think he was at MSNBC. At one, mm -hmm. at one point in time, I think he's been around all over the place. Apparently, he can't hold a, a job, but now he's working for GQ. I think he's doing like political commentating for GQ, which I didn't know GQ had a a, a channel or or what. But I thought they were like a fashion magazine. But uh, so what Keith's done, re I guess recently, and you guys may have seen this video. He had a video calling for foreign governments, foreign intelligence agencies 
to turn over, give out any information that they had against Donald Trump. Basically wanting to to overthrow, discredit, uh, deface Donald Trump because obviously they can't find stuff legitimately. So, you know, the fake news that Trump's always talking about, they're, they're out there actually just trying to strum up anything to keep their um, their agendas going, the, the left agenda, and trying to distract us from actual, you know, politics and things that Trump is trying to do for our country. So they're trying to blind us with all this, you know, look what's going on over here so you don't see what's actually happening kind of stuff. And uh, it's it's sad. I mean, isn't that treason what he, what he basically was trying to do there? You know, he's talking about overthrowing the government is what he was trying to do. <laughs> I would like to think that if you were born in the United States and you're happy to be here, you would not encourage uh, foreign intelligence services to overthrow the U.S. government. And that's what I read right. um, that he was doing. So I, obviously I don't agree with it. What Again, it kind of dovetails back into what we were just talking about. Everybody in this digital age is trying to garner attention and they're getting more and more outrageous with their claims or their stunts or whatever it is they're doing to draw. And in this case, Keith Oberman looks like he's made a pretty outlandish statement, cool. uh, including asking the, the Russian right. intelligence service to come on in <laughs> exactly. here and uh, I mean, he's doing, topple us. He's doing exactly, he's asking them to do exactly what he's accusing Trump of doing. You know, that's their whole thing is that, you know, they're saying that Russia had something to do with the elections and blah, blah, blah. blah. They can't prove it, but yet they continue to beat that dead horse and they've taken it to the next level to where, the, you know, Keith, o I thought this was, I thought this was a prank at, when I first saw this. I was like an April Fool's joke or something when I first saw this, but he's dead serious. If you watch the, you watch the video, uh, he's dead serious. Uh, Keith Olbermann demands foreign governments topple Trump. Uh, it says, in an appeal to the intelligence agencies and the government of what is left of the free world, this is a quote, I guess from his, uh, his video, uh, to GCHQ and MI6 in the UK, to BND in Germany, he's calling on France, he's calling on Australia, he's calling on, he's even calling on Russia, uh, where they must already be profoundly aware that they have not merely helped put an immoral cynic in power here, but an uncontrollable one whose madness is genuine and in whose usefulness to them is at an end. This is Overman's quote right here. He said this, To all of them and to the world's journalists, I make this plea. We are the citizens of the United States. We. He's speaking for all of us here, too. We are the citizens of the United States, are the victims of a, a coup. We need your leaks, your information, your intelligence, your records, your videos. Your conscience, <laughs> Jesus. Now we need your help. Whatever there is on Trump, reveal it. Issue it officially if you can. Leak it if you cannot. If your uh, let's see, if your directors and your governments want you to wait, look to the last days here and ask yourself if there's any real time left to wait. What? I mean, he's he's again fake news causing. Hysteria where there should not be any hysteria here. Seriously, this is this it's guy. It's just going to get worse. I, and, I don't and they're see hiding, this getting They're hiding any behind their media cards, you know, free speech of the the media. They're hiding behind that card. This is not news. This is not media. This is, I don't. This is treachery. This is he's being, he's a traitor. <laughs> and what happened? What happens to traitors? I come down you commit to if you're treason, not happy here, you're more than welcome to leave. You know, I see there's him committing plenty treason. of other land. Right. He's calling he's calling Trump a dictator in training. He's betrayed our constitution. How? How? How Keith Oberman has he betrayed betrayed our constitution? Because he fired Comey? He was well within his right to do that. The the Russian investigation's not going away. They're gonna continue to do that. The what else? So it's, I don't know. I'm just baffled by the tactics that the leftist media is using to try to keep this going. They have nothing left, so they resort to this. It's sad. But again, he's he's a GQ. What is he? 
I don't even know what if he's, he's at. if he's the political commentator for, for GQ. I, if I were in GQ shoes, I would ask him to have a disclaimer that says, you know, the views of Keith Oberman do not necessarily represent those of GQ because it, that's a men's fashion magazine, as I understand it. Right. That's you know, what I'm saying. Who not turns a political magazine? Who turns to GQ for their latest news anyway? So I mean, his uh, legitimacy is is in question to begin with. So I think he's just a washed up journalist media guy who you know he's just grasping here to stay in the limelight bingo so welcome to the jack wagon train keith olberman i can't believe i used to like that guy at espn too he used to be pretty funny at espn should have stayed there <laughs> well obviously he was a douchebag and they fired him it's like all the other companies that he moved to that's why he's at gq now i'd say he's not gonna be at gq much longer oh here it is gq special correspondent that's his official title and if you guys want to send him a message and let him know he's a uh, a uh, jack wagon, it's at Keith Olberman, K E I T H O L B E R M A N N. Let him know he made the jack wagon train. All right, so that does it for the talking lead jack wagon train this week. And if you guys have any nominations that you want for upcoming jack wagon trains, feel free to send those to me at talkingled at gmail dot com. And if you've got any other questions that you guys need me to, to answer or have answered, uh, as you know, I'm not the expert. I bring the experts in or go to the experts. Uh, just anything in general, firearms related, gear related, training related, uh, you can always send those to me at talkinglet at gmail.com. And then we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And then the show, if you would be so kind, leave us some feedback on uh, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, any pretty much anywhere you can download podcasts. That's where we're at. And wherever you're listening from, if you would, go ahead and leave us some feedback. I would greatly appreciate that. That helps us in the ratings somehow. I don't know how that works, but uh, we need it. Need your feedback. All right, Jansen, looks like Chad's a, a no-show. He may join us here a little bit later. But uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk bear hunting. And uh, as we were talking a little bit off air there, uh, you've got a little more experience than I had uh, originally thought. You've been on a dozen or so bear hunts in your life. Yeah, when I get into something, I, I get into it pretty hard and deep. And I got into bear hunting back in uh, 14. And um, one of my first bear hunt, after I did a lot of investigation and research, I knew I was moving to Idaho in 15. One of my first bear hunt, actually, with Glenn Seekins, the Seekins Precision, we oh, went cool. out and uh, did a spot and stock bear hunt, uh, spring bear hunt, spring of 15, uh, out in the Nez Perce County uh, area of Lewiston, Idaho. And uh, it was a lot of fun, really enjoyed it, hiked our, hiked our butts off, and uh, that was when I was really hooked. How's the spring in Idaho for hunting? What kind of weather are we dealing with there? Well, it depends on what elevation you're at. We went up to an area known as Craig Mountain, and it got it was pretty chilly, you know, in the morning. Once the sun got up, you were in the 70s or 80s. But yeah. you know, we kicked out at about three in the morning, drove for an hour and a half. Then we got in a side by side and drove for another half hour. Then we bailed out and hiked for two hours. Got up on a um, sort of a south facing slope and glassed for bears for an hour and a half after that. Nice. So the environment changed dramatically um, just because the elevation changed so much. Yeah. So I think that would probably be a good, a good starting point for our, our conversation is if, and I've never been bear hunting. So if I wanted to, to start, I wanted to get into bear hunting and I live in Tennessee and I know that just recently, I think uh, 10 more States have added bear hunting to their season. Uh, so more and more States are adding, you know, the bear hunting bears are, apparently becoming more and more prevalent. Um, how would I get into it? How, what do you suggest that I do to get started? A couple things. Um, read, you know, there's a lot of material out there on bear hunting. There's a magazine called, um, bear hunting, which is actually really well done. It's done by a guy out of Arkansas and you're right. You know, bear hunting has grown, um, in the last few years, several States have added seasons. Um, bears are very prolific, in both their breeding cycles and in their their ability to survive. So you saw Florida added a bear season last year. Right. New Jersey re-legalized bear hunting. Oklahoma, um, the southwestern, I'm sorry, southeastern part of the state has a season now. Um, you're right. They're they're growing and uh, they're, they're they don't have any natural predators. So 
if I were going to get into bear hunting from scratch, uh, I think bear hunting over bait is one of the easier ways to get into bear hunting and learn bear behavior, getting the ability to judge a bear in the field. Um, because really you get time to watch the animal, whether you're watching it on the trail cam or in person as it's coming into the bait site. So that's my suggestion is whether you started as a do-it-yourself hunt or not is another topic for discussion, but I would one say of the no. easier ways to get into <laughs> it would be over bait. Yeah, I would say do not do it yourself on your first hunt or two. Go with a guide so you you know you know what you're doing and uh, you do it right because there's there's some things that you can do that are detrimental that could be detrimental to um, the population itself. Uh, you don't want to be you know cruel to the bears, but um, so you're in Idaho, so every state's going to be different in their seasons and you know the rules and regulations as far as bear hunting goes. Uh, and you've probably been to more than just Idaho, so you're probably familiar with multiple states. And you've actually been to Canada too, I understand, uh, to, to do some bear hunting there as well. Talk about um, some of the rules and regulations that people need to be mindful of. Sure. So I've, like I said, I've been into it now for three or four years, really hardcore. And it just depends where you're going. So if you look in the United States, and then we'll compare it to Canada, you know, in the U.S., you've got three main ways you can take a bear, hunt a bear. You got spot and stalk, uh, bears over bait, and then hounds. And so it's very interesting. Uh, there's actually one state in the union that you can still trap bears, and that's Maine. So you've actually got technically four ways. So, so what are the difference? You know, in Maine, you can, you can spot and stalk. What's that? Which is uh, spot and stalk. Yeah, what's that? That's where you're, you know, out hunting in the woods, glassing trees, glassing ridges, looking for the bears, and then you're stalking up on them on foot. So okay. you're basically going to where they're at. So you're actually hunting. That's a hunt. That's a that's a real hunt. Yeah. And to me, you know, each one of those methods is hunting. It just depends on where you're at geographically. The terrain can dictate how you have to hunt the bears. And let's, let's look at Maine versus Idaho, right? I've hunted both for the okay. last three years straight. Maine, very dense timber, very dense forests. It's very difficult to spot and stalk anything in Maine because of the sheer density of the woods. So your only options in Maine are bears over bait, bears with hounds, or trapping bears with a legal trap um, in that state. Now so explain spot what stalk is bear, almost impossible. Explain what when you say bears over bait and I'll explain those, what each one of those means for our listeners. Sure. So bears over bait is you set up what is called a bait site, but really it's a bait pile of food. It's no different than if you're hunting deer in Texas where you're pouring out corn in a pile. Bear, a bait site is picking foodstuffs that's legal in that state and using it to draw the bear in. It's like having attractant. So I've seen popcorn, jelly donuts, Oreo cookies, table scraps, you name it. <laughs> a heard. grease, a, pr a pretty popular item is used cooking grease strewn cooking all grease. about the bait site. Huh. Okay. I was, uh, from the stuff that I've done on the research on it, it seems like they like a lot of sweet stuff. So like you're saying, like donuts, um, pastries, kind of things they are really attracted to those blueberries um i even heard somebody was using gummy bears uh <laughs> oh yeah it, it's funny i've seen it all i've seen all that stuff used in the in the worst part is uh when i've been hunting over bait sites in canada i'm sitting up in a tree stand and it's a long day and you're looking at that candy or you're looking at those cookies and they actually start to look pretty good <laughs> when you're, when you haven't eaten anything for five or six hours. Right. You're going to fish one up into your, your stand. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been thinking about it. So what kind of, uh, is there anything harmful that you shouldn't use? I mean, this sounds like all kinds of just junk food that, you know, they're throwing out for the bears. The bears obviously need a lot of calories, you know, cause they're, they're stocking up for their hibernation. Or they've just come out of hibernation, depending on, I guess, when, when the hunt uh, is. Um, what's something that you shouldn't feed the bears? I mean, I wouldn't use anything that's got plastic involved. So if you're using, you know, uh, bags of chips and stuff like that, and you're leaving the plastic or the, the wrappers there, none of that's ever good, obviously, from just a litter standpoint. But, you know, they'll ingest that stuff, too. Yeah. Um, in Idaho... 
they've got a pretty good guideline of what is and what is not good to go, so to speak. So in Idaho, you're not allowed to use other animals or parts of other animals, as I understand it, to bait bears. Um, they're, they're basically trying to make it a clear definition so that people aren't hunting over, say, garbage disposals or garbage piles, stuff like that. Um, in Idaho, bears will come into dumpster sites. And so there's also rules about where you can set up bait sites. You got to stay so many hundred yards away from a road, so many hundred yards away from a house, so many hundred yards away from a, a disposal or a garbage site um, to try and discourage that kind of behavior from bears. Yeah. So as a novice getting started, um, gear, what kind of gear are we going to need for this? Well, it depends on which which kind of hunt you're going on. So we'll go through each style of hunt okay. and then we'll go into the gear side. So we talked about spot and stock as your traditional glassing for bears and then going after them once you've acquired them somewhere on the landscape. Bear over bait, you're, you're sitting at a tree stand or ground blind looking at a bait site, you know, 30 to 60 yards away. Bears with hounds is the dogs are in the back of a truck bed and you're in the truck and you're riding trails waiting for the dogs to strike. A strike is when the dogs, you know, they're basically howling because they got a hot track. At that point, you release the hounds. And I actually enjoy saying that when they get out of the box. They're getting out of the truck bed and they're going after the trail. So those are the, the three primary means. And then in Maine, you can trap bears. And there's a very specific kind of trap you can use for the bears. So if you consider those are your, your four possible takes um, the gear can be specific to the kind of hunt. So spot and stock, you're going to be very active. You're going to want to layer and you're going to want to use stuff that's helping to pull moisture away from your body, away from your skin to keep you cool, um, depending on where you're hunting. In Idaho, in the spring, it can be snow and it can be 70, 80, 90 degrees. Um, same thing goes for Maine in the fall. You know, it can be really warm in the afternoon and cool down. And so, uh, it just depends. So for me, spot and stock layers, having the ability to go light so that if I do have to hike up a mile and a half of 35 degree incline deadfall timber, I'm able to shed those layers and stay cool and not overheat. When I go on the bait side side of things, I'm treating it like a traditional deer hunt. I want to make sure that I'm checking the temperature and I'm wearing an appropriate uh, garment that's going to keep me concealed and is also going to conceal my scent. So I'll spray down with some kind of scent blocker or scent eliminator. So camo, camo intense on the bait side side. If I'm going to hunt with dogs, I'm less concerned about camo and less concerned about anything else other than having a good sturdy pack to pack that bear out depending on where it gets treed. So I'll give you a perfect example. This spring, I took my girlfriend out for her first bear. Uh, we did it with dogs in Idaho. The bear treed about 600 yards away from where we were stopped with the trucks, but it was 600 yards down about 35, 40 degrees and in <sighs> deadfall timber. Oh, no. So you have to have what I would consider as really durable pants, really lightweight uh, clothing on the, on the top layer, and then a good heavy duty pack. Right. And then you got to have something to haul it out of there with too. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I use an Eberly stock, um, pack. So does she, so she shot her first barrel was, it was actually a cinnamon color, uh, color phase black bear. And I had never packed it out before. Um, I've always had help packing it out, but it was just her and I and the houndsman, they had to handle a mess of dogs. Right. She had just shot her first bear and was shaking and I was like, you know what? I'll pack this baby out. I'd like a, I'd like a good workout. And um, I would consider myself in some fairly good shape. I've been running and working out oh, a lot yeah. since I moved to Jansen, Idaho. And Jansen is svelte. Yeah, you're in shape. It, <laughs> it kicked, it kicked my ass in the sense that when I got back up that hill after 600 yards, I was soaked. But it was one of the best experiences for both of us because, you know, she got the enjoyment of you know, seeing that bear up in the tree, um, watching the dogs work. And those dogs are amazing animals. You know, they, the houndsmen treat them like tools. They don't have that same connection to a pet like you or I might to a dog or cat. Yeah. But those dogs are like meat missiles. You know, they yeah. get on that scent. They're heat seeking. They're work It's dogs. pretty impressive. Yeah. What kind of dogs do they use for that? What's the best? So 
different houndsmen have different breeds that they're, I guess I would say, aligned to. So I've seen plots, um, blue tick, red bone. Uh, the dogs that we were hunting over were plots hounds. And, you know, it's very interesting because there was eight of them. You know, they had what they would call their their hot nose dogs, cold nose dog, cold trail. If the trail wasn't as hot, they'll release these two dogs. If it's like a fresh track, these two dogs go. Then they have um, basically the rest of the dogs that'll catch up with them and, and stay on the trail. So I don't have the kind of experience to talk in depth about hound hunting as a houndsman. Sure. But from my experience going after them with dogs, the most exciting way to hunt bears, in my opinion, is with dogs because you get to see these animals work and how good their noses are. And the one of the most interesting things is when you get to the tree where the bear is treed, you look at the base of the tree and it is almost totally stripped of bark. These dogs are trying to take that tree down with their paws. They're trying to get it that bear. Impressive. Oh, yeah. So the bear is afraid of those dogs, even though it uh, it outweighs them by you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds, those dogs scare the, the bear. Right. The, the bear is basically saying, I don't want to take on a pack of hounds. I'm going to go up in this tree until they cool off. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting because I've, I've done a mountain lion hunt with dogs and I've done a bear hunt with dogs multiple times. The bear is more durable and is less willing to get in the tree. Whereas the cat, you know, mountain lion, a cougar, whatever your choice is for terminology, you know, their endurance level is, is a lot shorter. Yeah. They'll go a couple hundred yards and jump in a tree immediately. But bears are so durable. They'll run. And it's very interesting. And I've they're noticed fast that too, aren't they? What's bears, that? Bears are fast too, aren't they? Oh, incredibly fast. Faster than they get credit for, for sure. And you can almost tell the size of a bear depending on the chase. I don't want to say all the time, but in my experience, if a bear trees within the first 30 minutes, might be a good sized bear. If that bear is taking you on a run, hour, hour and a half, it's like oh it's got gosh. Nikes on. It's just running and running. They run it's that young, long? It's, oh my gosh. Yep. Oh yeah, the bear I took in Maine last year ran for two hours, and wow. it's going to be one of two kinds of bears. It's either going to be a really small bear, super agile, but maybe not worth shooting, or it's going to be a monster that has been educated and knows better than to get in the tree, and you got to shoot it on the ground, bait up. And that's exactly what happened to me in Maine last year. This bear would not tree. It was about a 250-pound bear, which is about the weight range where they start to get kind of kind of ornery you know those 300 pound bears are the nasty ones Mm -hmm. so this bear would not tree we had to cut it off as the dogs were chasing it in a clear cut and as it poked its head out of the tree line i shot it on the ground it wouldn't tree it had been educated it it knew better than to get in the tree because it knew what was going to happen again so you never know what's going to happen on the hound hunts and to me that is the most exciting part now, on a hound hunt, are you doing baiting on this, or are you just grabbing the dogs and you're hitting the woods? You're grabbing the dogs and you're riding trails early in the morning where the bears have crossed during night. And what you're hoping to hit is you're hoping that the dogs strike a track, you know, and then they get out. The houndsmen will look on the ground for the track the dogs are following, and they'll look at that print, that bear paw, and they'll say, okay, that's a good size print. We need to keep following this one. Or if it's a small print, looks like it may be a, a not so hot track, they'll pull the dogs back in. Cool. So um, we talked about the dog hunt. So what's the next one? Uh, bears over bait and spot and stock. All right. Let's talk about the uh, bears over bait. So baiting bears is one of the best ways to get somebody into bear hunting, in my opinion. And these are the reasons why. You get a chance to see multiple bears. You get a chance to observe bear behavior, and you get a chance to really learn how to judge a bear in the field. And I say learn how to judge a bear in the field because I've been doing this for three or four years now, and I still have a hard time judging bears in the field. Mm. Uh, The things that you look for when you're baiting bears is, you know, are they coming to the bait site? They're not easy to time or program, but if you get a game cam on the food site, on the bait site, you'll start to see you know, what's the dominant bear, which dominant bear is coming in. And then the, the smaller bears or the female bears, they'll dart in and out, you know, they'll run into the bait site, grab some food and then take off. Um, that dominant male bear, presumably a dominant boar will come in, sit down and look like he owns the place. He'll literally sit in front of the, 
the pile and scoop it into his chest and just start eating like a like a hungry, <laughs> hungry hippo. If you remember the game Hungry Hippos, you right. will see that go on sometimes. It's pretty impressive. That's funny. So they just they just start scooping it up and just sit there, plop down, and just putting it in their pile. Hole. <laughs> yep. They'll just sit there and chow down. And you'll see different kinds of bait sites set up different ways. So in Canada, I've seen baits with 55-gallon barrels filled with grain and Oreo cookies. And in Canada, I've also seen them hang a beaver over a tree as a scent attractant. Hmm. Uh, here in Idaho, we just use popcorn, uh, stale bread. Um, I've seen guys use rotten apples and st syrup and cane sugar that they get at the dollar store. Really sweet attractant. Yeah. Typically does pretty well. But uh, I've also seen table scraps used. How so. much How much of this this bait are you getting and how long do you bait for? That's a great question. And the answer is it depends on how often you can get to the bait site. So in my opinion, if you're able to get to that bait site every day, you don't have to load it up with a massive amount of bait because you're able to go check it on a regular basis and keep it loaded. But in the case of Idaho and a lot of these bait sites, you want to get away from human traffic you got to go two and three hours away from maybe where you live. So yeah. you got to load them up. So the guys that I hunt with here in Idaho, um, they actually work at a mill in town called Clearwater Paper, but they're avid bear hunters like myself. They're only able to bait that site maybe once a week. So they're filling that 55-gallon barrel up and then cutting a square, maybe four inches by four inches, and then the bear's got to sit there and work in that little cut cut out of the barrel to get the bait out. So it makes it last longer. What kind of barrel is this? Is it a metal barrel, plastic barrel? Yeah, 55 gallon metal barrel. Metal. And it's chained to the tree. Because if you don't chain it to the tree, they're going to take it. <laughs> they're just going to walk off with it under their arm. Do -do -do. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, they'll drag that stuff around. Oh, uh, can you imagine if you're a bear and you're just walking through the woods and all of a sudden you see this big pile of donuts? You're like, this ain't natural. <laughs> These don't grow in nature. <laughs> The the best bears that I've eaten off a bait site have been the ones that haven't been eating off the bait very long. It you know bears can be hit or miss, mm -hmm. and it kind of depends on the way you take them. So if it's a bait site bear, I haven't had very good luck with those tasting that good. But the spot and stock bears or the bears with dogs, just the bears that are eating some more natural stuff, blueberries, salmon, fish, stuff like that. Yeah, they taste really good. More of their natural uh, habitat, you know what they were ingrained to eat kind of stuff exactly so uh that makes me you know why don't they use more of the natural stuff rather than just grabbing all this crap for them to eat cost to, yeah. to that's come what right it boils down, down to, to it. right yeah it's, it's cost it's easier to go to the local supermarket or grocery store and say hey do you got a bunch of stale bread you know i'll give you 50 cents per loaf then let me get all the blueberries you got you know yeah now, they have um, scents and things that you can use, too, like blueberry scent. I I've, I've saw something about that, that you can spray that around with your, you know, with your bait. That attracts them. There's a bunch of that stuff, and there's different bait, bait pellets. There's a, a company that I've seen called Master Bait, um, <laughs> and it's, you know, bear bait in pellet form, and they've got cotton candy and blueberry razzmatazz and all that, and I I don't have experience using that. Again, the stuff I've seen. They get all my business. Well. Any company called Master Bait, <laughs> they get all my business. I have the cojones to name themselves that. That's hilarious. You know, Master Bait, Bear Bait is out there. You'll have to Google that one. That's great. I bet they do everything. I bet they do deer and everything. So, all right. So, that's. Is there any anything else we need to know about the. What is that called? That, that type hunting? Bait over uh, bear. bear. Bear over bait. bait. What is it? That's right. Bear, bear over bait or bear baiting. Bear to bait. me, you know, it's a good option of doing it yourself once you've been on a hunt and kind of understand how it works. Um, I've started to see more out-of-state license plates in the area that I hunt across the spring bear season. Guys from Illinois will drive out, set up a bait site. And if you're dedicated for seven to ten days, you can do it yourself. Um, the key, though, in my opinion, is knowing the terrain. You know, mm -hmm. Idaho is still pretty rough out here. Yeah. And uh, if you're not familiar with where you're going or what you're doing, you know, there's no cell service where we hunt, none. And not for quite a ways. And Chad can get into that uh, when he gets on the show. But, uh, 
you can get yourself in trouble if you're not familiar with what you're doing. But as far as the bear baiting goes, it is pretty straightforward. Okay. Now, as far as you know, knowing the terrain, you're saying know the terrain, one, so you know what you're getting into, and two, because there's certain types of habitats that the bears will be more apt to be around, like maybe swamps or something when it's hotter, that they're going to be around the water. You know, bears bears tend to get down into the shaded areas when the sun gets up and it gets hotter. It's stuff like that, you know, knowing the area, knowing where you should be camping at and what might be a good spot to look to setting up a bait site at, stuff like that. Yeah. So, and then the next hunt is the um, the first one we talked about. What was it? The spot glass. and stock. Spot and stock. Yeah. Talk about that. Right. So, spot and stock is your more traditional Western type of hunting where you're getting up into a high country, you're glassing on different faces or different slopes of stuff, looking for the bear itself and then putting the stock on the animal to get within shooting range. It's one reason that long-range precision rigs are so popular uh, in the western part of the country for hunting because some of the shots may be four, five, six, even 700 yards. Mm -hmm. A lot of these hunters out here are using, I don't want to call them wildcat calibers, but some of the longer-range cartridges that you might see in the PRS series, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Six, five Creedmoor is very popular out west here. Yeah. yeah, I've heard a lot of people switch into that six, five Creedmoor. They say it's a really good hunting round. It is. I've got a gun getting built in it. Um, 338 Edge is another one that's pretty popular out west here just because of the, the sheer distance that you may have to take a shot. And it may be the only opportunity you get after three or four days of hunting. Right. Makes sense. So as far as the let's – let's back up just a little bit to the bear over bait. Um, obviously, you're going to need some different kind of gear for that. Um, you're going to need a some sort of a tree stand. Is that just your, your, like your typical deer tree stand that you're using? You can use anything, really. I've done it several ways. I've used a ladder stand. I've used a blind. So on the ground blind, ladder stand in a tree. And I've also been on the ground basically behind a brush pile. So just brushed in on a rock. Um, if you're on the ground, it can be a little uh, interesting. <laughs> I've had cubs come in toward the bait site going right by my blind, which at that point, you know, there's a mama bear coming around the corner too. Right. But uh, if you're in the tree stand, chances are you're, you're good. You know, you've got a safe shooting angle to the ground. Bears are very unlikely to get in your tree. Although I've had two bears climb two different tree stands I was in this year. Coming after uh, you or they just were climbing the sheer, it? They're just sheer curiosity. Um, I had a chocolate black bear cub on my second day in Canada get in the tree to the point where I had to have the gun muzzle, the gun barrel in his face to keep him from getting up into the stand. And then on the fourth day in Alberta this year, I had a 200 pound solid black bear coming up the tree. And I actually took my vortex binoculars and beamed him in the side of the face and got him to run down the tree. Um, and I've posted <laughs> that video on our Instagram page. Actually, it's pretty funny. Oh, it's on your Instagram page? Mm -hmm. I'll probably repost it after this uh, goes live here for your viewers to check it out. Yeah, definitely. What Which uh, Instagram page is that? We underscore R underscore nerd underscore. There you go. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'll have to go look at that one when we get off here. That'd be cool. So um, gear-wise, as far as the uh, stock, scope and stock, is that what it's called? Spot and stock. Spot, yeah, I'll get it in a minute. Spot and stock, uh, just kind of your traditional... Um, hunting gear, nothing really special you need there, just a really good precision rifle, good glass, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I think if as long as you're treating it like any other Western hunt, whether it's mule deer, elk, whitetail, you know, layer appropriately, have a good pack, right. have a good rifle, know your zero, know your holds. Um, I think the 6.5 Creedmoor is a great cartridge um, for this kind of hunting out here. 300 Win Mag, obviously, is the gold standard, in my opinion, of Western hunting, because mm -hmm. you're going to have the distance covered with that cartridge. What about a 308? You can do it. Uh, I've been using the 308 last year when I was launching our Boar Buster line of ammo, and I took uh, two seven footers with that cartridge, um, just 168 grain bonded bullet through our Boar Buster line. Nice. Uh, one shot was 330 yards, the other shot was about 35 yards. So I've done it go. with a 308. Very good. 
So let's uh, let's talk about Chad. Doesn't look like he's going to join us. Let's go ahead and talk about your hunt that uh, you and Chad did. Now you guys were were you in Idaho? Is that where you did this this latest hunt? Yeah, we were, we were out in Idaho, spring bear season. Okay, so let's talk about that hunt. Set it up for us. Well, I will set it up for you, and I want to also leave a little bit of room for Chad's take on it all, because I think Chad's going to have a really good uh, part of the story. So I got back from Alberta uh, from my Canada bear hunt. I came back in, and a week later, Chad flew out, and he had his kel 308. Uh, he had a Vortex 1-6 to on it, and he'd really never been uh, big game hunting. And he said, you know, this is really a first for me in all kinds of aspects. And I said, well, you're you're going with the right guys. So we drove from Lewiston, Idaho, which is where Freedom Munitions is headquartered, west about two and a half hours. I'm sorry, east, excuse me, two and a half hours okay. um, to the Clearwater National Forest. Unit 11 and Unit 10 are where we hunt at. We were hunting in Unit 10 at this point. And uh, got with a guy that we know who runs dogs. And at this point, you know, there's no cell service. And Chad um, has a very awesome girlfriend, but she was basically cut off from him for the next seven days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I didn't know. I, I don't know Chad that well, but he's pretty connected to his phone. I was hoping he was going to make it, and he did. He's, he's a social media king, you know. Yeah. He is. He is. He was cut off for seven straight days. He so probably had Chad, withdrawals. <laughs> Ch Chad, myself, and my girlfriend went with us um, for – for the first three days and okay. this was over uh, memorial day weekend so we had monday off um my girlfriend and i went out with one guide and chad went with the other guy and i was lucky enough to get my girlfriend on a bear with dogs that first day okay is this so the one you talked we, about earlier yeah the, the 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 color phase brown bear yeah yeah so she gets her bear in the morning by about nine or ten o'clock we get back into camp grab lunch, clean up, change for the evening hunt. Now, the evening hunt is over the bait sites. Uh, so I went out with Jessica, my girlfriend, and set up in a great spot. And the spot was pretty dark. It's basically like a hole cut out of the forest, and I'm looking into it from a rock. The rock is all brushed in. Mm -hmm. And we saw this bear come in, and it darted in and out. And I'm putting binoculars on it, and I'm like, oh, it's dark in that hole. But that bear looks like a pretty good sized bear. And the way you judge, one of the ways I should say that I've been taught to judge a bear is if it comes up shoulder length with the bait barrel. So basically it's shoulder height of the bait barrel. Mm -hmm. That's a good sized bear. And I'm looking at this bear and I'm like, oh my gosh, it just grabbed like, it literally grabbed a hamburger bun <laughs> and ran off. And I said, shoot, you snatch know, I looked down. <laughs> it, it did, it did a snatch, a smash and grab. I look down at my shoes. I look up. There's the bear, and it took off. And I looked at my girlfriend. I'm like, holy cow, we got to keep paying attention because we've only been sitting here for about 30 minutes. The bears are coming in. So I got this 458 SOCOM suppressed with a silencer co suppressor, and I'm shooting our big grains load. And I'm like, I really want to get a bear on camera. So you can well, shoot I, suppressed there. Yes. In Idaho, you can hunt with a silencer. Nice. So we were, because quite frankly, I don't like wearing hearing protection. I wanted to be able to communicate with my girlfriend, see if she could get the camera on it, stuff like that. So next thing I know, this bear comes back in again. I couldn't tell if it was a different bear or not. But again, it's dark in this like cutout in the forest. It's a black bear, and I can see its muzzle. It's got a brown muzzle, and it looks big. It's big against the bait barrel. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take this bear. So I lay prone across this rock, get the muzzle out, and pull the trigger, hit it, it flips around, and it starts to take off. And I put another shot in it to try and anchor, and I shot it literally in the back left corner of its, you know, I guess I'd say I shot it in the ass if I'm being completely honest. Right. But uh, it was the only other shot I could get off because the window of opportunity was so narrow, the cutout in the tree line was just, at best, about 10 to 12 yards wide. I'm so sure after that two. first shot, he took out like a freaking dart too. I mean, it was fast. Oh yeah. He spun around. And so I got two shots <laughs> off and I got him with both. But at that point, you know, you got to decide, do I want to wait and go get the dogs or am I going to man up here and go after this thing? Yeah. And, uh, I manned up and went after it because to me, that's part of the fun. I really enjoy that thrill of chasing something that could potentially 
chase you back. And uh, I gave you. it 30 minutes just in case it had already laid down and was going to do its thing. Yeah. And I told my girlfriend, all right, let's do this. And uh, we did. We went to the bait barrel. And that was my first, I don't want to say first mistake, but my first error. And I learned something from this hunt. The bait barrel was not a 55-gallon bait barrel. It was like this 25-gallon oil can. Oh, dang. So, <laughs> so this, you know where I'm going with this yes, one, right? Yes. The bait barrel is literally this skinny drum. And uh, the tree that the bait barrel was tied to was a lot smaller than I thought it was also. Mm. And I looked at Because you're basing said, everything on a 55-barrel. Uh, bingo. 55-gallon barrel, yeah, yeah. Bingo. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, ugh, I don't like where this could be on, oh, but dang. haven't found the bear yet. So, and it's really dark in there. It's dark. The canopy over this is thick forest. So all of a sudden we see something move about 25 yards ahead to our right. And we're both a little concerned because it's dark. There's bears coming in. You just don't know what's happening. And we see the head. So we work our way around to the left of the bear and the top of it, looking down at about 35 yards. I give it another two shots of the 458 SOCOM. It's down. We go up on the bear, and it was not as big a bear as I thought. In fact, right. if Chad were on the phone right now, Chad would say, I shot a Labrador retriever. <laughs> he shot his dog. <laughs> It was, at oh. best, a three-year-old black bear. Man. And uh, I drug it out, actually, on my own. I didn't have to skin it in the woods. It was a young black bear. It definitely wasn't a yearling. It was uh, Idaho State fishing game pulls teeth, and they age the bears. They said it was a three-year-old bear, but I shot a very young black bear. Yeah. And so when I got back into camp, you know, Chad came in, and everybody was giving me this hard time. And it, it's truly a good example of uh, just when you think you've done a lot of something, you know, I learned something on this hunt. I learned to make sure that I checked what what was the bait barrel like? What was the tree like? Mm -hmm. The Check lighting in points. that particular area yeah. was really dark. And I made what I would consider some rookie mistakes on sizing the bear up. I got excited. I was psyched because my girlfriend had a great hunt that morning with the dogs. Oh, yeah. You can't let but, her show you up. Come on now. Well, she did. She got the big bear. Her 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 chocolate black bear was probably two to two hundred and ten pounds and I was I drug out this seventy five pound oh, man. <laughs> black cloud. Was it was it really only seventy five pounds? At three years old? I would expect it to be a lot bigger than that at three. No, it, it's it was about seventy five pounds. I drug it out literally. I took some paracord and hauled it out myself like I was dragging it on a leash. Um <laughs> No, they, they come out of hibernation in the spring and they're lighter than they are when they're bulking up for obviously the fall and the winter. Yeah. So no, they're pretty light, had a good fur, you know, good coat on it. Didn't have any rubs, but he was a pretty young bear. Yeah. Well, like you said, you learned that was a learning mistake there, but I guess that was the first time you'd been to that, that spot, obviously, cause you didn't know the size of the, the barrel or anything. Yeah, I learned a couple things there. And so, you know, just like when I got into competitive shooting, I had, there's a learning curve there. You know, with bear hunting, I'm still learning a lot of stuff. And one of the things that, you know, going forward will be on my checklist when bait hunting is get the binox out, scope out stuff relative to the bait barrel, ask the question, is it a 55 gallon bait barrel? Well, if I put better optics on that barrel, I could have easily known it wasn't. But bears get my blood moving. And when I saw that first bear with that, <laughs> with that bun in its mouth. Got a little I excited. Was, yeah. I, I was. I was focused in on that bear, and I didn't look at the surroundings to judge it, and that was the mistake. Hmm. So where was Chad during all this? So during all this, Chad was at another bait site and did not see anything that evening. And the next morning, I went out with Chad on the hound hunt. You know, I tagged out, so I was done. Mm -hmm. The next morning, Chad and I get up at about five and get in the truck and go with the dogs. Got some good strikes, but never got on a bear. And that afternoon, so now we're talking Sunday afternoon, uh, I had to get back for work on Monday. Even though it was a holiday, I'm still uh, the guy that's got to keep an eye on everything, so to speak. President of the company, job. yeah. Right. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that title. So I had to leave Chad. Now, one of the guys that works with me, Jeremy, was flying in uh, and going to be in camp that night 
with Chad. And so Jeremy took over babysitting Chad, so to speak, <laughs> and was with Chad Sunday night through the rest of the week. Bless his heart. What I what I can tell you is Chad, Jeremy, and Jim from Silencer Co. It was a combination hunt. We brought out a guy from Silencer Co. They had an awesome hunting experience with dogs. And I would really prefer Chad to tell that story, but let me give the viewers a little preview. Yeah, give us a little it high involves, level here. It, yeah, I will. I'll give you a little teaser. It involves a bear running down the hill with a dog in its mouth. Chad with a camera filming <laughs> and Jim from the silencer co trying to pump lead into this bear running with the dog it gets to him. Oh my gosh. Oh, the video is amazing. It, and silencer co is going to be releasing some of the video this fall. We're going to be doing something with this fall. Chad got a really nice bear. I don't want to spoil it for the viewers, for the listeners, but, uh, Chad had a great hunt. Jim at silencer co had a great hunt. Uh, it was a great time overall. And, you know, I think that if this is something after you hear Chad's story, mm -hmm. you'd like to try, you know, we'd love to have Oh, you I'm out. already in, we, dude. I'm in. I want to do this. Yeah. We should get you and Chad to come out maybe next year for Spring Bear in Idaho with dogs. And you could do a, you know, video podcast of this entire experience. Oh, yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. If we could get a signal. <laughs> you said the signals were pretty weak down there, so. Signals are non-existent where we're at in Idaho. Yeah, we'd have to record it all video cam, but that'd be cool. We could do that. That wouldn't be a problem. So I want to talk about, so you've been on, this one wasn't your most successful hunt, obviously. Uh, you went to Canada before this. How was that hunt in, Al you say, Alberta? Yeah, I was uh, north of, let's see, I flew into... Edmonton and was two and a half hours north. So yeah, that hunt was really successful. Uh, I took two seven footers. One was seven foot two and the other bear was seven foot six. Wow. So I've had, I've had my best success bear hunting in Canada as far as size goes. Yeah. But I don't think that that size is everything. You know, to me, the most memorable hunts, well, I, I come back to the one with my girlfriend, you know, I didn't pull a trigger. In fact, I did all of the the grunt work, so to speak. But to mm -hmm. me, that was the most fun hunt. But the, the, the Canada hunt was a lot of fun because you get to look at a lot of bears. So up in Edmonton, uh, north of it, two hours where we were hunting, um, that is a lot of boreal forests. Mm -hmm. So it's a little swampy. There's a lot of trees, but then there's some clearings and the bear population up there is intense. That's what I've heard. So much, much like Idaho, that part of Canada or uh, that part of Alberta has a two bear uh, limit because they're not able to take enough to keep the management in check. And so I went out there with one of the hunters we sponsor. His name's Keith Warren. Uh, he runs a TV show on the Pursuit Network. We went out there to film another episode. And basically last year, the previous year, we went up there with him the first time. I took two seven footers there as well, a seven foot five and a seven foot six black bear. Wow. So Keith said, well, let's go back and see if you can do it again. And I did. So we basically called it doubling down uh, <laughs> up in Alberta and the outfitter that we went with, he's been guiding bears for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. He really loves bear hunting too. And he said, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never seen anybody come and get two seven footers in one trip. And I've never seen anybody come and do it back to back years. He said, this is truly like hitting the lottery. You said, yeah, boy, repeat king right here. Well, you know what? The guides and outfitters hate that, to be honest, because everybody else in camp then expects that is going to happen. And truly, <laughs> I just got lucky. I mean, it's not common. You know, guys hunt for black bears their entire life trying to get a yeah, seven footer. Obviously. And yeah. I've been I've been doing this for three or four years now and I got four. You got four. So it's pretty rare. So what do you uh Obviously, you're you're harvesting them. You're you're taking the meat, right? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, I, do you do anything I with the furs? Like eating black bear. My girlfriend does not, but I'll make them into sausage and jerky, and I think they're really good either way. Yeah, well, I've heard uh, people doing the steaks and the you know the beef and all kinds of stuff with them. So and it's it's like deer meat. If you do it right, it's good. And uh, and I don't know, there's probably some recipes and things like that that you can get online. I'm sure there's tons of, of that stuff on how to properly prepare it. Are you doing anything with the furs? What are you doing with the furs, the skins? 
Oh yeah, I take so I take the hide and the skull and as much of the meat back as I can. If I'm in another country, uh, obviously it's a little harder to get all the meat back, but in Idaho, it's it's easy. Sure. Uh, with the with the hide, I will take it to our local taxidermist and I get him to do the tanning that's needed. And then right now, I've got a couple different things planned. So the first two bears that I shot in Canada that were the seven footers, I'm having them full body mounted like they're fighting. Oh, which would wow. be kind of neat. That's going to be and huge. Then, where, oh, yeah, it's where are you going to put a, that? <laughs> well, I was thinking about putting it between the doorway. So when you come through the door of my house, you got these two bears that are like ready to maul you. That's cool. That would be awesome. <laughs> that that was my thought. And then the uh, these other bears that I've taken along the way, I'm having them just tanned. And then I'd like to do some upholstery with them, honestly. I've always thought it'd be cool to do like, some kind of chair uh-huh. where the fur is the black bear hide or yeah. the footstool is the black bear hide, stuff like that. Yeah. Are you using their claws and things like that too? Actually, Teeth. yeah. I've taken the one of the, I'm not sure what the proper terminology is, but one of the incisors, if you will, of one yeah. of the black bears I've shot. I made a necklace out of it for my girlfriend for Christmas. It was pretty cool. Oh, aren't you sweet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting creative. What is so. she going to do with her bear? Does she do anything with hers? She wants to make a rug out of it. Okay. Yeah, it, it sounded like it had a pretty um, coat, so that, that'd that make a nice rug. Oh, yeah. A color phase bear, a color phase black bear is sort of the holy grail of black bears. So you've got three or four different colors depending on who you talk to. You've got blonde, which is almost a blonde bear in every sense of the word. You've got cinnamon, which is the lightish brown color. You've got chocolate, which is a darker brown or brown. And then you've got black. So you've got four types of colors. I've never shot a color phase black bear, um, but my girlfriend was lucky. The first bear she ever shoots is a is a cinnamon, which mm-hmm. is pretty rare. Well, you're one to talk hitting two seven-footers, so, you know. <laughs> I know. I go from two seven footers to about a three footer. <laughs> three footer. <laughs> I, he, I think he's going to square about five feet. But one of my buddies, he's uh, one of the guys that develops our website for freedommunitions dot com. He told me his goal, if he ever shoots a small bear, is to mount it standing up with its arms like it's out to give you a hug, and he was going to use it for a fishing rod holder. Which oh, isn't cool. a bad idea. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That would make a neat little uh, addition to the house there. Now, you're talking about the, the ammo that you guys were using. You're using the, the big grains uh, from Freedom Munitions. Did you use that on all these hunts? So well, it's new, Idaho, so I guess it was just the, the recent hunt, wasn't it? Or did you use it in Canada, too? In Canada, so in Idaho, I used a semi-automatic, you know, an AR-15, uh, 458 SOCOM with a suppressor. So there I used big grains, 458 SOCOM ammo. Mm-hmm. In Canada, I took a bolt action I think it was a Winchester XPR, and I used 30-06, our tagged outline of traditional hunting ammunition. So I used a 30-06, 165 grain load by Freedom Munitions. Okay. You got any of that in 308? We do. We got a bunch of different 308 offerings. Everything from 147 grain FMJ, 168 grain bonded bullet. Uh, we offer a little bit of everything in the 308 category. Okay. I'm going to have to pick some of that up with these 308s that I've got now. Definitely. Send me send me an email. Get you get you squared away. Oh, okay. Do you do you did you say you had that in the big grains? Is that part of your big grain line? No, big I know 308's is only, not a big grain, but yeah. Big grains for us is defined as anything 300 plus grains. So we're talking some of the oddball stuff if you will. 458 Socom, mm-hmm. 50 A&E, 500 Smith and Wesson Magnum. I got 4570 being loaded this month, and then we're also going to do, uh, potentially do, I should say, 50 Beowulf and 450 Bushmaster. Cool. So what do you recommend for the 308 as far as your line of, of ammo for hunting big game? Personally, I would recommend Boar Buster using our 168 grain load. So it's a 308, 168 grain nozzle or bonded performance bullet. That's it's a the very one. durable bullet. And so whether you're hunting hogs in Texas or Tennessee or you're coming out for bears in Idaho or you're even going to shoot elk, I believe that this particular load bullet combination in a 308 is devastating. Yeah, the boar buster, that's the one I was trying to remember. We talked about that at NRA also. Um, so, yeah, that's the one I was trying to remember. Definitely got to get me some boar busters. 
it's designed for penetrating really thick hides, staying together and crushing, you know, the shoulder bone or those really durable bone structures of, of animals like bears and hogs. Yeah. So when is the next season for hunting? It, I know in Tennessee, I'm looking at it right here, is October. Where'd it go? I just lost it. Deer, deer. Bear hunting. You've got the gun muzzleloader archery, dogs allowed, October the 3rd through the 7th, October the 31st through November the 4th, November 28th through December 17th. And there's different areas that go all the way up into January 1st. Um, there's three different zones. Gun, muzzleloader, archery, and then there's an archery only September 24th through October 21st. And then there's a gun, muzzleloader, archery, no dogs, November 19th through the 22nd. That's in Tennessee. <coughs> and it looks like every, it's mainly all in the east, east part of Tennessee. Every every state season is a little different, but uh, if you're just talking general whitetail, usually the archery season is before the rifle season, and then will carry on after the rifle season closes. Okay. It looks like it's just one time. You just got one little, like two, three months here in Tennessee that you can, you can do it. And there's a limit of one, one bear per hunter. It'd be fun to get after some Tennessee bears. You know, the, the, the Southern states that have bear populations, uh, they're more prolific than people realize, but yeah, Tennessee has got them. Arkansas has them. Mm -hmm. North Carolina is actually the state that has the best black bears for size in the United States because they never really hit hibernation. You know, they're these coastal black bears. Mm -hmm. They never get to temperatures where they go hibernate. And so they're eating year round. And the, the hunting opportunities for North Carolina black bear are, they're not inexpensive. Let's put it that way. And they're hard to get in with any kind of guiding because they're booked up for so many years in advance. But some of the biggest bears that I've ever seen uh, pictures of, never in person, but you're in the 550 plus class range, uh, and they're coming out of North Carolina. And then those are black bears. Yes, all black bears. So what about grizzly bears? Where do you go hunt grizzly bears at? Well, if you're willing to pay, you can go to one or two places, Alaska or Canada. So in Alaska, you know, you've got, uh, opportunities there you can get a tag as a non-resident or in canada you can go with an outfitter guide service as a as a non-canadian resident mm -hmm. in the lower 48 um, there is no grizzly bear hunting allowed you know they're protected um, in the greater yellowstone ecosystem that's where grizzly bears were reintroduced mm -hmm. and the greater yellowstone ecosystem is idaho there's parts of idaho montana and wyoming in that um, the biggest problem is they've thrived and now they're growing a little bit beyond that so to speak so mm -hmm. the zone that chad and i were hunting in uh, that unit i should say has um grizzly bears in it oh and really the state of oh yeah the state of idaho does a very good job of you know know your bear mm -hmm. you know for example black bears don't have a dish face um grizzly bears do Grizzly bears have the hump on their back. Black bears don't. And then also, if you look at the claws, you know, if you look at the track, the grizzly bear track is much more pronounced than a black bear. And without having the ability to show you the differences, basically that dish face and that hump, and then of course the color of the grizz is indicative of it not being a black bear. Let's right. put it that way. They're substantially well, bigger. Too. Again, another you know importance of no no your your target know what you're shooting because that could get you in some hot water obviously if grizzlies are protected oh yeah and, and you know it's it's very interesting the state of idaho has a uh, has the wild a fishing game wildlife outpost in different parts of the state and we're lucky to have one here in lewiston they have an example of a grizzly bear that was shot in this area that somebody took illegally they mounted it and use it as a teaching tool mm -hmm. so that you know first time bear hunters can see you know this is a black bear this is a grizzly you can look at the characteristics the features of the face the hump on the back mm -hmm. the the claws on a grizzly bear look like just these elongated witch's nails you know, i don't want to so, get close enough to ever <laughs> have to distinguish yeah, they're, <laughs> they're very gnarly but i mean those things are a wicked tool no doubt about it yeah rip your head off in a heartbeat 
Well, very cool. So I, we'll have to get Chad on and get his his story for his bear hunt another time. Doesn't look like he's going to make it. Um, but uh, anything else the, you want our listeners to know about bear hunting? Any, any tips, tricks that they can take away? Just give it a try. I think that bears are an amazing species to watch. I think bears are an underestimated species to eat. And I think that it is one of the most fun hunting adventures you can, you can do, whether it's spot and stock, um, bears over bait or hound hunting. It's a really fun experience. And it's even more fun if you take somebody with you, you know, I've done it by myself. It's not as much fun as if you take a friend or your significant other or or a kid that's into hunting. You yeah. know? And the coolest part is you can hunt them in the spring and in the fall in some states. You can hunt them suppressed. You can hunt them with an AR-15. As long as you know what the caliber, um, the minimum caliber or requirement is in certain states, you're usually good to go. Um, I know one of the guys that went with me on the spring hunt used a 6.8 SPC you know, in an AR. So hmm. a lot of opportunities. Yeah, definitely. Now, you said then your next hunt is when? I'm going to be going to Maine uh, last week of September. I make my annual retreat for fall bear in Maine, and I do that one with Maine. dogs. Okay. How's the how's the terrain in Maine versus Idaho? I mean, it's got to be completely different, right? It, it is completely different and is similar in this way. So lots of trees, lots of deadfall timber, but it's almost totally flat. There's a little bit of incline, don't get me wrong, but it isn't like hiking up 600 yards of 40 degree incline like it is in Idaho. Mm -hmm. Maine, the challenges in Maine is it's very dense, it's very boggy, and the bears out there are pretty wary. You know, they got a strong bear population, but they're hunted um, pretty well too. So yeah. Maine's challenge is the bears are smart, in my opinion. A little smarter. Smarter than the average bear. <laughs> Smarter than your average bear. Boo-boo bear. <laughs> Very cool. Jansen, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've been looking forward to hearing about y'all's hunt ever since NRA. And uh, sounds like Chad had most of the action, so um, bless his heart, he couldn't make it. I don't know what's wrong with him. When you get a chance to get Chad on, I think he's going to have an amazing story to tell you guys. Oh, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. We'll get him on soon, get his story. And I guess those videos that you're talking about, they haven't been posted yet, but they're coming. I'll get them up on the 4th of July so that everybody can see me ding this bear <laughs> with this set of Vortex binos. I actually knocked my iPhone down when I was filming it. I set the iPhone on the edge of the tree stand. I had my gun in my right hand with the muzzle pointed down to keep the distance <laughs> oh, wow. between the bear and I. And I struck it. You know, I'm a right-hander. I'm throwing these binoculars left hand. It was probably the most uncoordinated thing ever. But uh, you can see me hit this bear and then the camera falls down. So what about any, um, let's do this. Any, any myths out there that you'd like to de debunk about bear hunting? Misconceptions? Anything you I don't think, uh, think bears are as difficult to hunt as people think, but I do think they're more of a difficult animal to kill than people think they are. You know, I've read a lot on the discussion forums and, you know, I've read these things that say, oh, bears aren't like tanks rolling through the woods. Well, they actually are, in my opinion, <laughs> yeah, but they're, I think they they're, be, yeah. they're misconceptions. They're really quiet. You know, they sneak in. If you look at the pads on a bear's paws, they're like that of a dog. You know, they're really soft, leathery. They're quiet. That's what I've and heard. You don't, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're super They're really quiet stealthy. when they come in. If you don't make a good first shot, you may have to chase a wounded bear. And that is the most precarious situation. But um, And I think it's really coming down to making sure you select the right bullet for the job. You know, just because you're hunting whitetail with a 243 with, you know, pick your favorite whitetail bullet doesn't necessarily mean it's applicable to go hunt a bear. Yes, you can do it with good shot placement, but let's face it, you know, when you're hunting, you're not always afforded the ideal shot opportunity. You know, I, I come back to this, you know, this little bear that I shot for my spring Idaho bear. I didn't get a perfect broadside shot. He was behind the bait barrel. Mm -hmm. I had a quartering frontal shot on the first, basically his front shoulder. I hit that and he turned around and ran. I shot him in the rear because that was all I was afforded. And so, my I'm amazed. Is, I'm amazed. One that you're shooting with a uh, SOCOM 458 SOCOM, and obviously, I mean, he was smaller than you originally thought. That uh, he didn't just drop after that first one. 
they're they're tough. You yeah, know, they can soak up lead, and it comes back. That's to my, my point. Yeah, point. exactly. Yeah. yeah. You want to take something. I don't ever feel like I'm taking too much gun. I don't ever think it's overkill. I would rather have something that, that does the job the time that I need it to, given the fact that I may not have the most optimal shot opportunity. If I got something that's got moderate velocity and a good heavy bullet, it's going to do the trick. That's that's yeah. ideal. And that's part of the reason I developed the bore buster line is I like hunting with a semi-auto, whether it's a, a 223 AR or a 308. I wanted a durable bullet, something better than an FMJ, obviously, something better than a soft point, something that I could go tackle bears with. Yeah. And, you know, to me, that's that's an ideal 308 load for bears. You step up to a 30 out six, you know, I like a 165 AccuBond. That's mm-hmm. a nozzler projectile. That's what we load in tagged out. In the case of big grains where I use a 458 SOCOM, I'm using a 325 grain, you know, slug. Bowling it's ball. basically yeah. It's, yeah, it's hitting them with a with a hammer. So, and it's a solid, right? It's a solid bullet. So there's no expansion, but I'm putting a 45 caliber hole and I'm going pretty fast. Yeah, so. no doubt. So the, yeah. the, uh, the, gosh, the big grains and the boar busters are Freedom Munitions and they can go to www.freedommunitions.com and load up on those and you get free shipping, what, till the end of the week? Yeah, till the end of the week. The of the and week. Uh, please, if you do use any of this stuff and you do take a bear, tag us in it. I'd love to see it, and we'll yeah. probably rebroadcast it for you. Very cool. So uh, before we go, Jansen, give us uh, give us an update on what's going on with Nerd. So Nerd's my little design house side project. We just released a uh, new line of T-shirts and some hats. Um, Nobody ever really knew what NERD stood for, and it stands for Next Evolution Research and Design. So we have a new T-shirt that looks like a crossword puzzle with Next Evolution Research and Design spelled out on it. <laughs> um, we've got a new lineup of knives. So we partner with a, a custom knife maker out of Texas. Oh, cool. His name is Matt, his name is Matt Helm. And uh, we have those blades going online live toward the end of this month. Um, for sale. And they've got our little logo on them, and Some each one's knives? handmade. What's Hunt, that? Hunting knives? What what kind of knives are we? A little bit of everything. So yes, there's some hunting knives, what I would call uh, just a good do-all fixed blade. There's some axes, actual butchering axes. A um, cool. little bit of everything. Okay, yeah, I gotta check those out. Definitely. Did you take uh, any of that on your hunt? Any of those knives? No, they are just coming into us in the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to get some Kydex for them and they'll go live on the site. There you go. Is it a limited number? Yes, there's a total of 13 and each one is unique. And due to the uniqueness of them, I usually create a dedicated lineup naming each one individually. So with this lineup of knives, I think I'm going to name them after different different academic tests so i'm going to call one the sat another one the act maybe one the mcat the lsat the bar exam so the bar exam <laughs> yeah because it wouldn't be nerds without nerdy names right <laughs> bingo you got it now you guys do something cool like on on fridays right on instagram don't you do a little thing oh yeah freestyle friday freestyle friday talk about that or tell our listeners about that i think it's pretty cool so it, it's it's actually taken on a little bit of a life of its own. So on Friday, I'm usually up in the morning at the gym, and my little pre-gym routine is I'm on the elliptical just getting warmed up. And I'm listening to music, and I'm kind of rhyming in my own head. And so what I'll do is I will take whatever it is I'm thinking about and incorporate it into that post. So whether it's a new product launch or just a, a customer photo, you know, I'll hashtag Freestyle Friday, and then I'll go ahead and you know, throw out whatever, whatever wordplay I got going on on there. But the coolest thing is I've started to have, you know, whether it's customers or just followers respond, you know, basically throw back their own verse. And it's been pretty awesome seeing that wordplay going on between us and, and the customer base or the followers. Very cool. And this is, is this strictly on Instagram? Yeah, I I don't really do too much other than Instagram and uh, Facebook gets the the post as well. I got you. So I'm wanting to do another giveaway. Um, we're celebrating, continuing our 200th episode celebration, and uh, we're giving away stuff now until the end of the year. And I've got another tactical squirrel 
a premium box that I'm going to be giving away to one of our listeners. And I need to come up with a little, um, a little contest for them to do. All right, Leadhead. So to continue our 200th episode celebration, as promised, I've got another Tactical Squirrel uh, premium box that I'm going to be giving away. And this is from this month, June. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, it's July. So this is going to be June's box. And what's in that box is uh, Team Never Quit Ammunition. So you're going to get a box of that. Uh, caliber, your choice. So you'll have to let me know when I pick the winner. Grunt Style Gen 3 Tactical Belt. You're going to get a hollow point gear ammo brass valve caps. You're going to get a Tactical Squirrel exclusive Hanger Nut T-shirt. That's their new shirt with the the squirrel with a uh, a nut that looks like a grenade. It's pretty cool. Uh, Badass Babe Lip Balm. 1791 Gun Leather Universal Leather Holster. A Rothko Triple Mag Rifle Pouch. And some Counter-Strike Coffee Never Quit. So that's all that's included in the premium box for June, and one lucky leadhead is going to get that. And here's what you're going to have to do to qualify. So you're going to send me an email. Send me an email at talkinglead at gmail.com. And the question is, or the, the contest is going to be, you got to go to Freedom Munitions website. And they carry several different brands of ammunition under the Freedom Munitions banner. How many different brands do they carry? And tell me the name of them. So it's that simple. Did I say that right, Jansen? You think you got it? Okay. So you think they'll understand that? So so go to Free Munitions website. Tell me how many different brands that they carry. Tell me what those brands are. Name them, uh, and send your answers to talkinglead at gmail dot com. And in the subject, say TS two hundred. No, let's see. I got to make it easier to do than that. This is 206. So, so TS 206 in the subject and just say answer and then put your answer right there. And then we'll randomly pick a winner. We'll give you a couple of weeks to get this in. And then the winner's going to get this awesome tactical squirrel premium box. And you're not eligible, Jansen. <laughs> Darn it. And if you want to go ahead and subscribe and get your own monthly subscription to Tactical Squirrel, go to our website, TalkingLead.com. There's a link there that you can sign up and go ahead and start subscribing and getting one of these boxes every single month. They've got different level of boxes that you can sign up for. Uh, the premium, obviously, is going to have all the, the awesome, cool stuff in it. And if you sign up and become a member of Anterius Alliance, you get $5 off uh, each monthly subscription box. So go do that. They make great gifts. So if you've got somebody with a, a birthday, anniversary, um, just a thank you gift that you want to sign somebody up for, makes awesome gifts for that. Or if you've got uh, service members overseas, uh, they make great little um, gifts and just say I love you kind of things to send to your, your man, your woman, your dad, your brother, your sister that's overseas as well. TalkingLead.com, click on the Tactical Squirrel link, and that'll take you to the uh, the link to sign up for that. And as a lead head in your first monthly subscription box, you get a little extra something. So go do that today. Jansen, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, hopefully, uh, we, you get me and Chad up there again and, and do some bear hunting with both of us. And I'm sure we'll get Chad on and get his side of the story soon, too. Well, I think we need to just set this date and make sure uh, spring next year we okay. get you out, chat out, and we uh, we do this thing. What's the date? I'll write it down right now. Well, it's usually the last two weeks of May and the first two weeks of June. So I just got to figure out what's going to work with my schedule. And I'll okay. send you guys an email. We'll figure it out. May, June. Sounds good to me, man. I'm down with it. And uh, real quick, give Freedom Munitions site um, – where people can go, social media is all that? Sure. Website's freedommunitions.com. We're the online low-cost leader, direct-to-consumer ammunition. Whether you're buying 50 rounds or 50,000 rounds, we'll deliver it right to your door. Uh, the Instagram and Facebook handles are the same, Freedom Munitions, at Freedom Munitions. And uh, if you're interested in listening to me freestyle on Friday, check out my Instagram page. It's <laughs> we underscore R, A-R-E underscore nerd. And uh, I get jiggy with it. You do. 
you come up with some some pretty cool stuff. And then their website is www.wear-nerd.com. And they've got some awesome products on there too. And their t-shirts are cool. I've got one of the nerd t-shirts. Um, so you guys go check them out. Charging handles, the uh, coffin nail. The coffin yeah. nail. I get that backwards. I've got one of those. Been using it in my uh, 300 blackout from Nordic Components. Uh, it works really good. Love it. How are those nine millimeter barrels doing? Oh, <laughs> really well. We got some 16 inch uh, Ward barrels coming in this month. So we'll have a 12 and a half inch and a 16 inch nine millimeter barrel. So they're they're doing well. We got some coverage in uh, World of Firepower magazine. They did a 50 page spread on all the different nine millimeter PCC components and. You know, we were really fortunate to be featured in that. We uh, Very cool. we didn't send those guys anything. They actually they purchased the stuff. So to me, that was a real compliment. If if they're actually spending their hard earned money on the parts, I guess that that means they feel it's worth it. So yeah, it, it adds more to their reviews on it too. I'm sure. And what magazine was that? Say it again. World of Firepower. World of Firepower. Okay. Very cool. And that's this month or July. Uh, I believe it's June. So June, July. I think it's a bi monthly. Okay. Very cool. You guys go check that out. I'm sure you can get it at most of your major retailers. So big thanks to all the companies and partners that make this show happen. X Steel Targets for all your AR-500 steel target needs. Check out X Steel Targets. X Steel Targets. Frontier Tactical. They have the awesome multi-caliber uh, adapter called the Warlock. It can convert your AR-15 into being able to shoot up to 90 different calibers with just one little component. And uh, they actually have their own line of ARs now, the FT line, that comes standard with the Warlock system on it. So go check them out at FrontierTactical.com. Modern Spartan System. Optimize your firearms with Modern Spartan Systems. They have gun cleaning solutions. They've got lubricants. They even have some things for your, your trucks, your vehicles, the TVT uh, line of engine protectant. I've been using that in the lead sled here since uh, I've gone over the 300,000 mile mark in the lead sled and uh, it's still running strong with the TVT engine oil additive from Modern Spark Systems. Check them out. Glock, the official carry of Left Hand at Talking Lead. And I hope you guys have seen those posts that I've done, the exclusive uh, pictures that Glock sent me of their MHS Glock 19 that was submitted for the, the XM-17 competition that the Army had. Uh, obviously, they went with SIG at this point, but uh, the things that they've done to that Glock, you guys need to check it out. I think uh, we're going to see more of that, maybe in the civilian market. I don't know. Uh, but it's a 17 frame with a 19 slide. They've put an external safety on it. They've uh, made the slide release ambi. Um, the safety's ambi. There's no finger grooves on it. Uh, several internal things that they've done that's still secret. Hopefully by the end of the month, I'm going to get the lowdown on what all that is too. So you guys stay tuned for that. Um, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, did you see? Did you say you saw the pictures of that, Jansen? Yeah, I saw them on your Instagram feed. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then since, there's been a couple of other um, media outlets that have released it as well. I've got some articles on it, too. Uh, but we're going to do a follow-up to our MHS show that we did, talking about the modular handgun competition. Uh, we've got some more information that's been... Uh, that might shed some more light on the whole process and uh, how things went down. So stay tuned for that. Um, We'll have more and we'll be posting things on our social media with that. So until our next episode, Leadheads, keep your loved ones close. And your firearms even closer. And you can get some ammo even closer than that from freedommunitions.com. Happy 4th of July, Leadheads. <laughs>